why does everyone tell the story of Luke's Christmas, including Snoopy? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 1. All right, so saying Luke 1 is about as fun as saying Mark 1, and I still think Matthew 1 was the best. I'm worried about someday when I have to say Ecclesiastes 1. You know, it just doesn't roll off the tongue the same way. The title, The Gospel According to Luke, came about because the oldest text we have is from 175 to 225 AD, and the early Christian church fathers suggested this was Luke. His name doesn't appear, like the rest of them, in any of the writings. I was thinking a little bit about it. You know, it matters of who he is, that he was in close proximity with the apostles, that he came about to do a dedicated writing about what happened during the life of Jesus and then what happened after Jesus was resurrected. I don't care if his name is Bob or Simon or Fred. It doesn't really matter who wrote it as long as it has the credentials that the author clearly has. Luke was also named a couple of times in the rest of the Bible. He was mentioned in Philemon. Paul sends his greetings to to, quote, our dear friend Luke the doctor in Colossians. And when Paul was in prison, he wrote a letter to Timothy and says, only Luke is with me. So Luke was a guy who hung out with Paul quite a bit. We know too, and we're going to find out in his writings about why he wrote this and what he did to write this. He seems to be, first of all, writing at the highest level of Greek. So he's clearly an educated human being, clearly a doctor. and. This is a two-part book because Acts is going to be the second part of his writing and talks about the early church and what happened. I'm excited to get to Acts. I think it'll be fun. The Gospel of Luke is addressed to someone called Theophilus. So there's a debate in the commentaries about whether Theophilus was a real human being because what it means is lover of God. So someone said, this could just be any lover of God. It is someone who loves God. But then I saw another writing on it, and it said that actually Theophilus was a named human being. And we'll figure out when we see Theophilus mentioned, whether or not we think he was a real person or just written to anyone who loves God. Luke, like Mark, was written for Gentiles. This seems to be a group of people who are parts of the early church, people who are already Christians people who already are following Jesus and wants to know, maybe because they were not witnesses themselves, what happened. So this is almost like a journalistic endeavor so we can tell people what it is Jesus wanted and who Jesus was entirely. We know that he focuses in on the parts where Jesus is the Savior, is the Son of God, set out with a purpose. And he talks quite a bit about people who are downtrodden, who are abused by the system, who are just poor or in bad shape in general. Some other themes that we'll see, that this gospel is for everybody. We have mentioned all those places before. Everybody is a part of Jesus' gospel. He is coming back to save all of humanity, not just one nation, not just one group of people, but everybody, including that nation and group of people. He includes, what do we do next? What is our job now that we believe in Jesus? Jesus was resurrected and has gone back to sit at the right hand of God the Father. What is our mission? What are we supposed to be doing now? As a secret highlight, we're going to see Luke talk about people singing. You know, Matthew didn't talk about people singing. I'm not much of a singing person myself. And when you think of things like psalms, you know, people wrote songs to express their emotion. In Luke's gospel, we'll see people have songs with their deep, heartfelt emotions. This is something that's kind of stunning to me, and we're going to see a couple of them as we go through this. So Luke starts out at the beginning where some translations say, in as much, you know, where you squish it all together in one word. I like that. That's kind of classy, that he has undertaken this idea that he's going to compile a list of all the things that people say about, again, the time of Jesus on earth, and the resurrection. And then in Acts, he's going to talk about what happened after that. And even Acts itself begins, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So he knows that whoever this lover of God is, we need to know the truth about who Jesus is and what he did here. 
So it starts out with a really incredible story, one that we have not seen in Matthew and we didn't see in Mark either. But we hear that, first of all, we know that this is the time of Herod. We knew that before Jesus was born, the king of Judea. You know, so that's going to be the southern kingdom named Zechariah. And his wife, who is a daughter of Aaron, is named Elizabeth. So they both come from a priestly class. They were both righteous and blameless in the commandments and statutes of the Lord. They didn't have a child, and they were in advanced years, old enough to not have children, and she couldn't have children even when she was younger. So he was serving as a priest before God, which means they take turns doing the priestly duties in the temple so that the work is shared among all of them. And so he was chosen to be the person who enters in to the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Meanwhile, people are praying outside. It says, then an angel of the Lord appeared on the right side of the altar that had the incense. Zechariah said he was troubled, fell in fear. The angel said to him, and it's so funny, right? The angels seem like to be good guys, right? I mean, they know they must be very scary looking, but they always say, don't be afraid. So they tell him, don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. You're going to have a child. His name will be John and you'll be joyful. You know, this is going to be happy news and he's going to be great before the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Maybe that's ale. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, because we find out later that when he meets Jesus in the womb for the first time, he leapt with joy. But what's interesting about it is someone indicated that before Pentecost, this was from a commentary, but the Holy Spirit went from person to person, that it was something that happened to you at a moment time, that you were filled with the Holy Spirit. After Pentecost, we are all filled with the Holy Spirit. He is the one who gives us faith to know what to say, to know God's word. It's in our heart and that he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. So this whole Elijah part where he is going to be the one who prepares the way, who tells of God's will, of the prophet that every Jewish person from the time of Elijah on waited for Elijah to come back and prepare for the Messiah. He is going to be in that power and spirit, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the disobedient to wisdom. So people are going to go back, and he will prepare people to accept Jesus as the Lord. So Zacharias says to the angel, well, I'm an old man. My wife is advanced years. You see, he learned early on in his marriage not to call his wife old, but to say she's of advanced years. So then the angel says, well, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to tell you this news. So because you question this, you're going to be silent and you won't be able to speak about all these things because you didn't believe what I said. Everything will be fulfilled in its time. So the people were waiting outside for Zechariah. I wonder what's taking so long. You know, this incense thing is not this long of a deal. What are you doing in there? Well, they weren't allowed to go in and check. So then he comes out and he wasn't able to say anything to them. They realized, it says that he saw a vision in the temple, maybe because he was so shaky and he kept trying to sign to them, you know, that he, what happened to him while he was in there. So then his service ended. And he got to go home. That's, you know, how the service to the temple worked. So then Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept it hidden to herself. Namely, probably by wearing very blousey dresses. But she said, the Lord has done for me when he looks on me to take away my reproach from people. I think people, you know, Unfortunately, when something happened to someone like they weren't able to have children, you wondered, hmm, what'd they do? It's terrible, first of all. But now she is going to be blessed by this birth. What's cool, I think, about John the Baptist family is what a great way to get an education. These are the two people who could really provide the best education of what God wanted from his people, what the scripture says about God what we hope for then in the Messiah. This, these were the right people to do this. So I think it's exciting. Not only that, 
Elizabeth is cousins to Mary. So this is a parallel story to what happens with Mary that we heard in Matthew. It said that she was from Aaron's grandson, and it said that Aaron had 24 grandsons. So she was part of a very special family of priest worshipers. So then it says in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel sent to the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph. And this was Mary, of course, and says, greetings. I like that. Oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. And she was troubled because, I mean, wouldn't you be troubled? I'd be troubled. And so the angel says, don't be afraid. You found favor with God. You're going to conceive a child. His name will be Jesus. He will be great and called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. There will be no end. Now, this was part of the prophecy in the Old Testament. And Mary's like, "Mm, I don't think so, because I'm a virgin and that is not going to happen. And she says, the Holy Spirit will come to you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore, the child will be born and he'll be called the Holy Son of God. And not only that, cool news, your relative Elizabeth And he calls her old. You see, angels are not married. They know you don't call your wife old. Zechariah understood you don't call your wife old. But, you know, angels, right? So he says, Elizabeth's old and nothing's impossible with God. And she says, you know what? I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. Wow. That's what I think so interesting about Mary is one that she was very young, but had the right attitude of it all. Any one of us could be told this and we would be freaked out, scared, wondering what people will think. Mary just had that peace about her that she could say, let it be to me according to your word. Wow. So Mary makes a wise decision because now she's pregnant. And so she has to go and go to the hill country and visit her cousin Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So she got this right from the very beginning. She understood, which, I mean, had to be a huge relief for Mary because no one's going to believe her. Everyone's going to think that she slept with somebody else. And of course, that was the smear that everyone did to Mary for the rest of her life. They accused her of sleeping with a Roman soldier. But Elizabeth, man, she got it. And I'm sure as a scared young woman, having someone like Elizabeth be there for you, boy, that's, that's, that is just such a blessing also to Mary. So then Mary sings a song and the song is beautiful. And it is been put to hymns. It's been put to music so that people can sing it. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. What young girl says that? That is why she was blessed with this. She could hold this together and then sing a song like this. Great things for me. And then she says that his mercy is for those who fear him. Now, I've never liked this word fear because I heard it too in temple that we should fear the Lord our God. What does fear mean? Why do people say fear? Fear is kind of a common word, but it's probably better to say in awe. But but for us in this situation, awe, awestruck, respectfully, you know, that's what she's meaning for anyone who is awestruck by God. I'm not afraid. I don't think God wants us afraid of him. I think he wants us afraid of being without him. So it talks about from generation to generation, you know, this is something being fulfilled. And he scatters the proud. I'm I'm paraphrasing here. You should read the whole poem itself. Then it says, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers, Abraham and his offspring. So when Mary was about three months pregnant, she went home. So isn't that amazing? I, I guess it's so great to hear how impressive Mary is. John the Baptist is born and she gave a son. 
And they're all like, hmm, what should we name him? Should we name him Fred? Should we name him Bob? Should we name him? And then he writes, you know, Zachariah is writing this down because he still can't talk. And I'm sure that was another blessing to Elizabeth. So he's signing. I have a name. I have a name. He writes it down, John. And they're all like, hmm, John. Finally, he spoke and said, his name will be John. And everyone was like, whoa, dude, you just spoke. People were talking about this. And all who heard it says, laid them up in their hearts. What will this child be? I mean, what does this all mean? So everyone was curious about it. So I think we're starting to see a more expanded picture. You know, it seems like in Matthew, This is a woman who was told something startling by an angel. And Joseph was also told something startling by an angel. And you get this feeling, it's just like the two of them against the world. What's nice about this is this is expanding the people. Not only was it Zachariah and Elizabeth, but it's also the people who heard it. They were excited to hear it too. So I think there were a lot of people wondering, what's going to come of this story? How is this going to happen? Because everyone is bursting out into song or poem, we get another song or poem. And this one was called in Latin, Benedictus Dominus, which NIV says is praise the Lord. And again, people put this to song and used it in services as well. And this particular prophecy, it said he was filled with the Holy Spirit and blessed be the Lord, a God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people. And it talks about how the servant of that in the house of David, he spoke by the prophets and that we should all be saved and shown mercy and the covenant. This is where it's important that he swore to the forefather Abraham is going to be delivered. This is going to happen. So all these people that we get to when we get to the end of Luke, who are like, "Mm, we're not sure who Jesus is or we're not sure what he's going to do here. People early on got the picture. This is what's happening. And then at the end, he says, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light and to those who sit in darkness, the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Wow. So we know right from here what's going to happen. This is Such amazing insight from such a dedicated religious couple. They know how this is going to pan out. And then at the end of the first chapter, Luke, it says, the child grew and became strong, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So we know that John goes out. We assume, because his parents were older, that he went into the wilderness after they died. And so they were no longer with him. But those two are the right people to teach John everything he needs to know. So my meditation is about praise and worship. I think it's wonderful that Mary burst into this praise of a, either a poem or a song. And so did Zachariah. How we express our joy with God is interesting. I think we're all different kinds of people. Some people will write songs, but people like me, we're, we're not very wordy people. I, I think this is hard for us. So I think looking at their example of how they praise God is a good thing to meditate on. And my prayer is that if I had anything shocking happen to me, that I would have that presence that Zachariah and Elizabeth had, or Mary and Joseph, to couples that are great examples of people that we should be in times of certainty, but mostly in times of uncertainty. Just really great. And what I want to share with other people is about this couple, Zachariah and Elizabeth. I don't think they're mentioned as much. You know, I've read this before. Obviously, I've read the Bible before, but just wonderful to read their story again and how that From the very beginning, right from the start, these two dedicated people. You know, we see later on in the Gospels, all these people who worked for the temple structure, who didn't do a very good job, who weren't faithful to God. But it wasn't everybody, because we have these two as 
wonderful examples of what we could do instead. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd like to hear what your experience is. There's something that I could do that would make your Bible experience better. I'd love to hear it. Or if you just want me to pray for you, I'm happy to do that too. Thank you so much for listening.